Thank you to everybody uh, for joining our webinar on our latest research and analysis of uh, the FTSE uh, websites. Really pleased that you uh, joined us um, and uh, in sharing some of our findings and research. In terms of uh, who we've got on the call today, um, it's myself, I'm CEO of the UK Office of Black Sun, um, so look after all of our work and business in the UK. I'm Erica, who's our head of research. Uh, say hi, Erica. Hello. And we have Dan, who is Head of Digital Strategy. Say hi, Dan. Hey, guys. Um, so, uh, yeah, as I say, welcome to our session. Um, in terms of our agenda today, um, we'll just do a little uh, intro to Black Sun, because I know some of you won't be fully familiar with uh, our, what we do and our digital work. Um, then we'll take you through a bit of a background into the Web 100, um, i.e. the research of our uh, FTSE uh, websites. Um, and the broader horizon series. Um, and then Erica and Dan will take you through some of the key findings and trends um, and show you some best practice examples of what we've seen this year um, and uh, you know, how things have changed over the last 12 months or so. Um, really interesting analysis coming up, uh, particularly given the uh, situation in COVID and economy and so on. Um, please do feel free to ask questions. You can do so um, by the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. We'll also uh, do a couple of polls through the session just to get some uh, interaction engagement with you. And so please do feel free to uh, engage and make the session much more uh, interactive and engaging for everybody, I'm sure. Um, kick off, I um, thought it would also be useful to share um, where some more information is on our website. And we even put a QR code there, so if you feel like taking a picture, it'll take you straight to the page where some of the summary info is given. Um, and we'll update that post uh, this webinar and then post a couple of other webinars that we've got over the next four weeks or so. Um, so please do feel free. Um, in terms of Black Sun, many of you will be familiar with us, I'm sure. Um, you know, we're an international stakeholder communications agency um, and you know, we've been in business for 20 odd years, um, really helping organizations build more valued relationships with their stakeholders. It's so really helping define, articulate, and communicate value communication story to the diverse audiences, you know, investors, employees, customers, and the broad communities at large, um, and also across channels, whether it be digital, annual reports, social media, moving image, and so on. So really uh, integrated communications for uh, corporate. In terms of our digital work, you know, we do uh, obviously corporate websites. I thought we'd share some of the most recent work, Coca-Cola HBC group website and their 20 odd country sites we pushed live literally a couple of weeks ago. We also do campaign websites. This is an example of a uh, website we did to uh, help reduce the wastage of food. We also do data-driven solutions and bespoke builds for our clients. So this one shows one we did with uh, Bolt Exchange, a really uh, fascinating project around integrating their member data and so on for, for the interview. And we, of course, do uh, online reports and moving image. So a rich tapestry of digital work and obviously happy to share uh, any further information that you wish on us. But enough about us. 
Um, what I did want to show just before going on to the uh, view of the Web 100, and this is relevant, I know it's very traditional for agencies to show logos of all the clients they work for, but this will become relevant, I promise you, uh, when Dan shows the uh, analytics information that we want to share with you and how that shaped some of the work we've done in terms of the analysis. And so a rich tapestry of uh, organizations across the uh, FTSE and beyond. So in terms of the Web 100, this is now the sixth year um, of our analysis of corporate websites. Um, I have to say we've seen some really interesting trends and analysis. I mean, probably back in the first year that we did the research, websites were very much a uh, kind of repository of information, very static, almost a library of information. Um, and today I just think it's a real active, dynamic, up-to-date hub, almost a go-to destination, hence the uh, title of the presentation, um, for a variety of different stakeholders. Um, and I think, you know, I think all of us have probably recognized the vital role that your corporate website has in your communications. You know, it's probably the one place you can communicate your corporate story to all of your different stakeholders. We know from research from Ravel, McKinsey, Accenture, and so on, that it directly affects investors' investment decisions. We know from other research, it's also the top preferred resource for prospective employees to go and look at before applying for a job. And it's actually their third most way of uh, actually uh, applying for a job itself. It's also a go-to destination for journalists and sector specialists, either writing on the sectors or your organization, getting profiles, seeing what your positioning is, purpose, and so on. And I think also this year, you know, it's shown beyond anything else, you know, how important it is in a COVID world, you know, digital communications and your website are really of paramount importance. So um, in a way, that's why we titled this year Renewed Purpose, Renew Reality, because we recognize the impact of COVID on the corporate website and the broader communications mix. Um, and I think what evidence this has been shown in the uh, poll results we've just shared with you, how important the corporate website is in your overall mix. And I think what we're seeing is um, just to progress. Yeah, a unique insight into corporate websites. You know, over the six years, we get the latest trends, assessing against best practice. And it also shows how corporate website stories are evolving over time. And we actually look at about 226 different metrics. And you may be wondering how the uh, diagram there is built up, and I'll explain that in a little while. But there are two main ingredients that we look at. The first is the overall user experience. So how easy it is to navigate, to find the content you're looking for. Does it you know, fit mobile devices and so on, which is probably a given these days. Um, but we also look in depth around content um, and the content that each of the individual audiences require. And so to show you how that kind of diagrammatic adds up, you know, clearly we look at the overall corporate narrative. So that is, for example, do you expressly communicate what your purpose is? Do you evidence your strategy, corporate objectives? Do you share governance and approach risk management and so on? A whole plethora of things for your corporate narrative. Um, on investor relations, um, you know, do you show your investment case? Do you communicate financial performance and KPIs effectively? Is your overall investor narrative working to join the different elements up? showing how business model interconnects with your investment case and so on. Um, we also look at careers information. So do you communicate your career opportunity and proposition? Um, and uh, also whether you, know, you can apply for job search and find roles, you know, see people profiles and so on. In terms of media, perhaps they're one of the shorter sections, but interestingly we're seeing media look much more at insights and thought leadership as well as news, um, profiles, image libraries and so on. And then for sustainability, obviously, there's a broader narrative around your approach, material issues or focus areas. Do you show case studies? You know, those sorts of things really looking in depth around uh, the sustainability communications. And of course, there's then the experience and how it all joins up, and hence the diagrammatic that you're seeing on the cover of the research. So hopefully now that makes sense as to how that builds up. Um, however, we do have a new element this year that we've added into the mix, which is, if you like, a real world uh, element. And I'm going to hand over to Dan at this point, um, and he will basically uh, share with you what we're seeing in terms of the analytics. Dan, over to you. 
Thanks, Rich. So I think the, the important thing was how we could add value. We've done the, the metrics. We've looked at what kind of best practice um, is from, you know, asking the questions of, you know, what exactly what Rich was going through on all those different sections. But actually, what does it mean for the tangible user? How do we identify who these audiences are and think about how we can use the data that we're seeing coming through to really enhance user flows and think about how we can add value. So what we started to do was look at, you know, essentially, if you're an investor or, you know, a journalist, where are you going on the site? What are your main focus points? Actually thinking about where the dwell time is, so actually where the pages are kind of most valued. And then that can help drive those decisions in terms of how we navigate. So we can then start to build up literally a home page or an investor page based on that research. So again, it's battled into kind of the information of how we can improve things um, for the site. So here you can see we've got our standardized kind of uh, structure of our website. We're looking specifically at the investor audiences and we can see from here that the top page views are really around RNS results and share price. So they're very much granular in terms of the detail. Now actually what was really interesting is dwell time because then we saw an increase in you know things like annual reports, content driven kind of pages really establishing where that kind of you know content heavy element is results presentation so again actually spending a lot of time on the presentation itself and thinking about obviously what that means for for the uh, the business and what we actually then started to do was think about well once those investors have looked at that information where are they going to next where are the areas of the site that they have the biggest interest in and therefore where we should be focusing whether it's investment improvements in functionality innovative kind of content storytelling whatever that might be and again you can see here for the at a glance section focused on things like governance around the board things around purpose and vision and we'll come on to some examples later on around that and especially around strategy and really starting to build up that kind of showcase of exactly what the key elements are for each one of those in terms of the audiences we looked at two other audiences so we then had the sustainability audience as well and again page views no huge surprises in terms of what we're looking at here in terms of uh, overarching approach materiality stakeholder engagements documentation um, and then dwell time again those kind of case studies bringing it to life bringing those stories to the fore and not just saying we're doing this but actually backing it up with evidence hard evidence of the great work that obviously the business is doing to really impact all of these different elements and then again, looking at brand, looking at purpose, looking at the board, those pages coming to the fore. And there's a consistency here with what we're seeing around the what we do, the board, the business model, et cetera, in terms of what then audiences are focusing on, especially telling that story of who the business is, how it's being run, et cetera. The final audience was really around journalists. So again, no surprises in terms of media heavy, in terms of the page views around news, RNS, assets, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but what was interesting, again, is it backed up our kind of thought process around where those users are then navigating through to really get a full snapshot of everything that's going on in terms of the, uh, the business. So, you know, again, at a glance, bored you'll see some consistent elements there in terms of the pages that we're seeing for all audiences in terms of those focal points, which I think was a really interesting angle. And actually this year, the, the ability for us to then collaborate that um, uh, analytical evidence and understand what it means, again, as I said, adds a level of value to our research because now we can start you know, almost fortifying exactly what pages should be, how they should be structured, where the focus should be, and exactly where we can add value in terms of enhancing those websites over the course of the next 12 months. Um, Erica, do you want to take us through the, uh, the key themes in terms of uh, what we're seeing across this year? Sure, I'll be happy to. Thank you, Dan, for the All introduction. Yours. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you again for joining us this morning for this webinar. I'm here to present the overarching findings that my team has uncovered this year after reviewing the FTSE 100 websites in our Web 100 research. And um, broadly, there are five uh, topics I want to touch upon. Uh, purpose, strategy, ESG, uh, sustainability ambitions, as well as COVID communications and the way uh, corporate websites have been communicating this year. So the first one, um, the first finding that we will talk about is 
the greater focus on purpose. Um, our Web 100 research this year is aptly titled Renewed Purpose for a New Reality, um, because in particular, we see a sharp increase in purpose communications on corporate websites. Now, unlike last year's finding, you know, where we saw stagnation in purpose disclosure hovering around mid 50s, more companies are stating their corporate purpose this year on their website bringing the number up to 71%. Uh, this is consistent actually with the findings that we saw from the uh, rewiring for resilience research. Um, some of you might have joined our webinar earlier in June where we did a review of the annual reports of the FTSE 100s. And we similarly saw that purpose has moved beyond being a slogan on the inside of the front cover of the ARs as we see almost all of them, all of the companies we saw set out corporate purpose uh, moving you know, beyond creating value for shareholders. And this is consistent with uh, what we're seeing the past 12 to 18 months, where we see momentum building around purpose on a broader scale, uh, where corporate purpose saw a significant movement climbing up to the top of the agenda for businesses and investors. Um, and post COVID, especially after the pandemic, the associated economic impacts, uh, we would expect to a purpose to gain even more focus as companies rethink their strategy and um, are more willing to try to answer to greater calls for social responsibility. Now, among the companies that are stating purpose on their websites, we saw that more than half, so 40% of them, uh, put purpose on their homepage or dedicated page. Uh, Coupling that with our web analytics analysis, um, revealing that among our reviewed websites, our clients with a dedicated purpose page, uh, the majority of them actually, the purpose page is among the top most frequently viewed pages for audiences in the investor relations and sustainability sections, uh, reflecting, I think, increasing focus among investors and wider stakeholders alike. Now, are companies making it easier for those audiences to get to purpose? That's the next question that came to mind. So for that, we then looked closer at where purpose is referenced or linked in the corporate websites. Um, and we find that among the FTSE 100, strongest linkages to purpose comes from the sustainability section at 54%, uh, followed by careers at 39%. So this suggests that typical sustainability and career audiences are often the targets for corporate purpose messaging. Um, and I think uh, companies should consider providing greater linkages to purpose from the investor relations sections, really. Moving on to our second finding, um, we see that there is more sophistication in um, articulation of strategy in corporate websites. Now, this year we see 78% of the FTSEs providing overview of their strategy. This number has been relatively unchanged over the past four years, but there has been a change in the level of strategic insight provided since last year. For example, uh, we see increased level of details uh, with 23 websites now outlining strategic targets, 19% disclosing strategic timeframes. While the numbers may seem low on an absolute value, the relative percentage increases from last year is actually quite substantial. Additionally, we also see increased level of insights uh, with 24% uh, providing explanation around key market trends and 22% explaining how the company itself is responding to these trends in their discussion of strategy. The third finding that we saw is the much greater spotlight on environmental, social, and governance topics uh, around the disclosure on ESG topics. Uh, since last year, we started reviewing the IR sections of these websites to see how many discussed or referenced ESG. And last year, we saw 13 companies discussing ESG in their IR section. This year sees 34 companies doing so. Now that number is more doubled than since last year. And it reflects, I think, the increasing focus um, 
on ESG disclosure for investors and the corporates uh, meeting that focus, uh, trying to uh, basically seeing the opportunity that they can use the corporate websites as a good source for responding quickly and providing more up-to-date content around these important topics. Um, around ESG, we also see uh, an upward trend on the detailed insights. Uh, the number of corporate websites providing ESG related reports and documents, for example, in their IR sections has seen an uptick. Uh, we now see 23% of companies doing so. Um, and while the overall... So I think uh, Eric has just lost some of the internet uh, connection. Um, so what we've seen here, I'll just pick up uh, just until she comes back. I'm sure it'll be momentary. Um, as you can see here, you know, you've got upward trend on uh, insights around ESG. Um, so as you were saying, 23% of them now provide related documents in their IR section. Um, and 16 provide uh, ESG related presentations, which again, as she was saying earlier, is much higher than last year. Um, I'm going to hand back now to Erica, who's come back online. Um, we won't ask her uh, internet provider, <laughs> as we all have those challenges in uh, this world. So Erica, over to you. We've just done this slide, so you can pick up from here. Thanks. Thank you for picking up the ball that I dropped, Rich. <laughs> Plenty of was, fine. <laughs> yes, it totally was. I was unexpected. Um, so as Rich was saying, we discovered trends around ESG, but now I would like to take us to the fourth trend, which is around sustainability um, ambitions or disclosure. Now, while, while um, from the discussion around ESG, where the, the term itself, it tends to be used to describe topics covering material issues to be communicated to investors and ESG raters. The term sustainability offer encompasses wider topics that are material, not only to shareholders, but to the wider stakeholder groups. And so we looked at the disclosures around sustainability from that angle on the corporate websites. Now, we have been tracking companies who disclose their sustainability performance historically, so they provide sustainability performance data and found that there is a flat trend of companies disclosing these historical uh, performances and, um, and it's, it, it still has not uh, evidenced the, the ambition that is increasingly you know, being communicated. Uh, the number of those leveraging interactive charts is actually even smaller because that's one of the ways where you can bring data to life and um, we wish that there's more corporate websites doing so. Now, looking at our web analytics analysis, we, the data shows that users are interested in sustainability. They are also likely to browse corporate narrative contents such as business model and purpose. However, in our website review, we find that only a little over half of the websites reference purpose in their sustainability section and only 21% make it clear how sustainability relates to their business model. Uh, I think this reflects the gap in the strategic approach to sustainability communications. Finally, um, COVID. We reviewed the overall approach to COVID comms on these corporate websites as well. Earlier this year in March, when we first went into lockdown, uh, my team did a initial scan of the FTSE 100 websites to find out, uh, to find that the market reacted very quickly by communicating their response and how they're supporting different major stakeholder groups, customers, employees, communities. Um, even then, some companies were already looking beyond the initial responses such as press releases or social media posts by creating centralized hubs to focus all ongoing stakeholders communications in one place. Uh, fast forward to July, when we did our Web 100 research, we found that 58% of the FTSE 100 corporate websites have such a dedicated COVID page. However, we find that only 31 of them um, provide up-to-date information, and uh, we, uh, not all of them actually are up-to-date content-wise, and um, there's a gap there in, 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 in trying to to centralize everything and keeping it um, really on, on top of the news. And um, that concludes my findings. 
um, and can I then ask? Um, Sorry, okay. yeah. Before we go into the poll, there's been a couple of questions yeah. coming from the audience, which is great. Thank you. Oh, um, all right. Firstly, um, will we share the deck after the call? Yes, absolutely. Um, everyone on the call will be attending and we'll get a copy of it. Perfect. Um, and then there's a really interesting question, I thought, around uh, individual versus institutional investors and whether they should be set up as a target audience. And, I, you know, when we look at a corporate website, we absolutely do uh, factor that in, i.e. whether it's predominantly institutional or individual investors. And you can see in looking at the analytics that you do have those two different uh, profiles of audiences. Um, uh, you know, for example, you know, how much they look at share prices or uh, RNS and so on. Um, and for the question I asked earlier, what well, RNS is, regulatory news service, was the perfect answer for, uh, that somebody gave back in the audience. So thank you for that. Um, and I think also the other thing that's interesting already in thinking about the investor section as well is whether you are catering also for investors who know you and those who don't. Uh, because clearly there needs to be perhaps you know, more signaling of uh, you know, performance historical and investment case for those that perhaps know you a little bit less well. Um, as well as those signages across to strategy and purpose. And so I definitely factor those different uh, things into your thinking when creating that section or updating your investor section. Thank you very much for those questions. Erica, do you, it might be worth just um, chatting a bit about, because I know some conversations around ESG and sustainability, it might be interesting just uh, to look around that, conversation around that, around the difference between those two. Um. Sure, Rich. Uh, I think as I might have mentioned a little bit earlier uh, in terms of terminology, um, ESG is typically uh, used to communicate on topics, key material topics uh, that are impacting financial performance and therefore uh, typically targeted towards investors and ESG raters, uh, whereas you know, sustainability as it stands today um, uh, still covers a broader scope uh, mm -hmm. in terms of the topics that still contribute and, and co corporates are waking up to the fact that they are needing to pay attention to them in order to build a sustainable business uh, because they need to take into consideration with wider stakeholders. And um, these are... Uh, I guess historically had always fallen under the CSR bucket, and 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 I think I think that's why uh, we're still seeing a lot in the corporate websites uh, the sustainability section. Uh, sometimes uh, the older versions you see companies are in a journey, right? The ones that are still uh, shifting their sustainability, uh, sorry, the CSR offering and to sustainability, and then they're pulling out the material information and putting them under the investor relations section. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, I see more and more companies also are growing. They're putting more importance in the sustainability metrics. That's why I highlighted the performance data bit because um, they, uh, I see more and more corporates are not just pulling ESG data just for the sake of submitting it to the ESG raters and for investors to improve their rankings, but they are also uh, waking up to the fact that measurement is important. They need to keep track of their sustainability performance, measuring the impact that, um, I don't know, the, the, the community engagement perhaps, that if you are a, a real estate company, if you're building in a certain site, you need to have heavy community engagement and you measure that over time. Um, or the, uh, I don't know, the impact on, on clean water that you're using uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the extraction industry and things like that. That's, that's mm -hmm. the kind of uh, movement that I see and a number are encouraged by that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Erica. And uh, Dan, we had a question here around um, whether we're seeing companies pulling out a section specifically labeled ESG. Um, are we seeing that at all? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it aligned with what Erica was just saying. So um, people are putting more prominence on it. Um, whether it's a separate section or it's within the investor section, what we're seeing is a trend towards obviously giving it its own space, actually creating a hub where it links off to other areas of content throughout the site. And I think it's um, interesting that juxtaposition between sustainability and ESG and how businesses are maybe sometimes not quite 
sure which way they need to go with it. But again, that comes back to what Erica was saying around this journey we're on in terms of how things are evolving, how the terminology is evolving, how things like TCFD are linked in as well. And all of that manifests itself in some really great examples, which I'll, uh, I'll show to you in a moment. And then there's a question here as well around um, whether we're seeing companies using their corporate websites to communicate their net zero strategies and how they're doing that. I think we're seeing a little bit of that on the uh, Eric and Dan. But... Yeah. Yeah, not, not, not a huge amount at the moment. Some people have kind of specific kind of pages and sections on it. Um, we've seen a couple of examples of maybe some of the airlines previously having separate websites devoted to it. So it, it's an interesting kind of angle, but there's, there's definitely a drive towards maybe more clarity around exactly what businesses are doing with that forward looking kind of vision. And then thinking about how those metrics and targets are being manifest themselves and showcasing how they're evolving again on their own journeys in terms of the, the, the kind of the data. Right, thank you. Okay, excellent. Uh, thanks very much for the questions. Do keep them coming. Very happy to uh, pick them up as we go through. Um, what we're going to do now is Dan is going to basically share some examples that we thought would be interesting for you to look at in terms of what we've seen on the uh, scorecarding analysis. So uh, Dan, over to you to share some uh, live examples. Thanks, Rich. I, we do have obviously the slides within the presentation, which you'll uh, you'll see after the event. But there's nothing better than building, uh, bringing a website to life by actually using a website. So, uh, hence we're here. So hopefully you guys can all see the uh, the screen. We're going to start with um, purpose and strategy. So we've got a few examples of how businesses are really enacting on that purpose. And I think fundamentally seeing how businesses use different ways to bring it to life, whether that's through video, whether it's through kind of multimedia lots of different kind of examples. So the first one we're gonna start with is Burberry. So they've uh, got our purpose front and center in terms of the uh, the company information. And what they've done is they've used um, the guiding principles of creativity, open spaces, and how that manifests itself around these four pillars of the strategy. Um, what they've done is a really nice kind of way of bringing that to life. So, you know, discovering the purpose, clicking on this is an immersive 360 degree um, kind of user experience. So again, you're understanding that these four pillars and how they resonate, but also as you go through, this is all linked to what was their autumn winter fashion show earlier in the year, which was done at Kensington Olympia. And there's uh, the ability to then navigate through the space in terms of what you're seeing, understanding what each one of these pillars relates to and how they manifest themselves. And then as you're going into each one of these, you can then see how they're bringing it to life in terms of what the kind of core content is. And then going one step further by obviously adding video as well um, in terms of bringing that to life. I won't play it, it just got loud in my ears, so hopefully you didn't hear that as well. But there's a really interesting way of then bringing those key messages to life in terms of uh, all that is there in terms of the purpose and everything else. Um, we were talking about the data. So Erica mentioned that about 40% of businesses are putting kind of purpose front and center on their, their website. If I just reload that Anglo-American example that you'll see here, you'll see the first thing you're seeing is purpose, reimagining mining to improve people's lives. It is front and center and allows you then to discover more about purpose as you kind of go through. And I think, you know, bringing that to life through the use of video here, it's all about reimagining this mining to improving lives, thinking about the integrity, smarter innovation, thinking about how it impacts the people. Um, and it's a really nice um, approach of how they're kind of telling that story and showcasing how through the heritage of the business and how the forward looking nature of the business, they're also then kind of intertwining it with exactly what their main kind of purpose is around everything that they're trying to achieve. Um, Lloyd's is uh, another great example. So we've got uh, Lloyd's and Anglo, a few examples in terms of uh, what we're kind of putting together. This is the Lloyd's Banking Group homepage. Um, you can see that they've actually included our purpose in the main navigation. So again, you know, really focusing on that driver in terms of what that means. And their, their main kind of focus is helping Britain prosper. So through this, you can then start articulating, you know, how the explanation of, you know, the plan is going in terms of what they're trying to do, how it impacts people like people, the community, uh, you know, the business businesses around them and everything else. So interesting kind of angle on this. And then as you expand through the section and you navigate, you can actually then see how it's actually impacting and they're bringing to life some stories. So they've got things around big conversations. They've got things around data and what it means in terms of what they're doing and then impacting that and how we're helping. So again, a really nice example of not just showcasing the trends or not just showcasing what they're driving towards, but as I mentioned earlier, showcasing what it means in terms of those tangible stories and actually resonating with audiences in terms of what we're seeing. Um, Smith's is another great example of maybe how they're bringing this uh, kind of strategy to life. And again, thinking about how they're linking 
the strategy and KPIs and then driving that through with the performance and objectives, but also then thinking about progress. So here we are on their strategy page. This is navigated through the who we are section. So you've got things like the Smith's way leadership and then our strategy. And then as you're navigating through into this page, you can then see they're bringing to life, you know, how, what their kind of core messaging is, understanding how it's all linked. And then obviously then thinking about what each one of those means. So whether it's, you know, defining its business, focus on attractive markets, maximizing growth, that forward looking element to all of this. And as you're scrolling, discovering more about these kind of five key areas, you then start going into then the key performance metrics as well. So you've got here around operational performance and then what it means and how it's linked back to that strategic objective. And we think this is a really nice way of kind of resonating that core data with what we're trying to achieve in terms of our purpose and our strategy as a business. They go a little bit further as well in terms of Smith. So we've got this nice example here where you are now in the investor section. I'm not navigating between each one because I just wanted to make sure we had some examples in terms of that element. But in the investor section, you've got things around um, this introduction to Smith. So when I click on this, you'll see that there's not only a snapshot, there's not only the data in terms of the overview, things like business model being linked. But what we really love is things around mega trends. So this is almost saying, actually, you know, what is it that's coming up? What is it, you know, that needs to be understood and how as a business are we thinking about whether it impacts how we're making it how we're developing it how we're delivering it whatever that is our people our development um, everything that's going around so really interesting angle here in terms of showcasing that strategy and thinking about what it means in terms of those mega trends and beyond I'm going to return back to the Lloyd's example here and again another kind of uh, good way of showcasing the strategy within the investor section so here you've got how the group is performing, um, thinking about what they're doing, but also then legislating that against their key objectives. So when it comes back to that time frame of saying, here's what we're trying to do, here's what we're trying to achieve, and then thinking about progress and then next steps. So again, resonating with it. And it's very text-based. It's absolutely fine to do. But the core narrative is here in terms of each one. And then they're kind of showcasing the examples of how they're really making an impact and making a difference in terms of what they're trying to achieve. Really focusing on here, you know, focusing for 2020, that next step in terms of how it's being brought to life. A couple of things we mentioned earlier in terms of just what we were chatting about. So I'll just refresh this, but the Siemens um, have got a great example of how they're bringing their strategy to life. This is their vision 2020 plus. We've talked around kind of, you know, um, storytelling on pages. We think that, you know, there's a great immersive way of navigating through and thinking about how users can kind of bring that to life. So here you're going to be taken on a journey as you navigate down through the, the, the page. You've got kind of six key areas in the navigation, which I'll show you in a minute, but it really articulates what the strategy is, what they're trying to achieve, even talks around their purpose in these opening kind of few slides and gives the user time to immerse themselves in really what the articulation, whether that's long-term value creation, profitability, things around structure. It's outlining that in terms of what they're trying to achieve and beyond. So here you can see, obviously, they've got the purpose in terms of serving society. And this all manifests itself as you then transition through. There's ownership from a CEO level as well, which is great because obviously it showcases the importance as a business in terms of what they're trying to do. And consistently, you're getting that kind of overarching kind of piece of what they're trying to achieve. As we then navigate through the next sections, you've then got positioning, which is great because it sets out the why, the what and the how of what they're trying to do. I'm not going to take you through all of these, these pages, but essentially just taking you on the, the kind of outline, but things around company setup. So thinking about how these, you know, different areas of the purpose link together using kind of easy to understand kind of um, uh, infographic kind of elements. And then as you're scrolling through, they're actually then showcasing each one of these and then linking it off to other areas within the site. Again, a really nice way of not just siloing content, but really immersive storytelling and then linking out to other sections. We then got things around culture and then not what needs to change. And this is all around the values and behaviors of the business. So understanding what it means, the ownership of the you know, ownership culture, thinking about the behaviors of the, the staff, the business and what they need to kind of uh, do that to execute goals. So fundamentally, they've got seven key goals of how they're going to achieve all of this in terms of uh, the next steps. And again, it's really simply done just using iconography. But again, immersive storytelling of exactly each one of these elements understanding what it means to the business and how they're going to actually impact that overarching change.
And the final piece is really the path. So thinking about then what they need to do to complete this. So thinking about this as a journey, as you're then kind of scrolling through, you're seeing these kind of elements of a graph building, thinking about how, you know, this kind of 2020 vision is completed and where they're going to go in terms of raising the bar. And then as you kind of transition through this in terms of the next steps, you then also get all of these great articles around how they're implementing these kind of elements. So, you know, Siemens on a successful path in some uncertain times, thinking about how that relates back to COVID and the uncertainty around things and resonating that again with proof points and storytelling. Um, moving on to the ESG section, um, as kind of Erica was talking around earlier. So Ashdead Group is a great example of how they're using ESG in their main navigation. So actually giving it prominence in here in terms of, you know, replacing the sustainability section and thinking about responsible business, but making sure that users kind of understand how that is brought to the fore in terms of maybe some of the key areas that are important, such as health and safety in our people, and then linking off to those kind of specific subsections and storytelling. Again, a very simple but effective way of bringing that story to life using obviously then very kind of key elements around kind of you know home pages and, and content pages and landing pages to help users navigate through each one. Barclays have a specific hub so again as we go through in terms of their society section you'll see that they've created a, an ESG resource hub around things like themes and highlights and obviously the, the ratings and benchmarks and as a user drills down it really starts to tell the story and allow you to understand exactly how that progress is being brought to life in terms of everything you're seeing um, and there's great things around reporting and disclosure um, again thinking about how that manifests itself in terms of you know the statements and policies and everything else in between and again and again allowing users to really kind of delve down into content um, in a single repository Prudential have a, a slightly different approach so they've gone with um, this section within the investor section so again just if I navigate through in terms of the investors um, allowing me to then navigate through to the ESG section itself sitting here in the navigation um, again, front and centre ownership from the chief exec, which again is great, gives a, a prominence to the section in terms of what they're trying to achieve. And really thinking about that in terms of next steps around how they're reporting, how they're linking that to other kind of areas within the business, and thinking about that in terms of whether that be news items or reports, um, or really thinking about how we can link out to other web pages that are relevant within the, the, the website to help bring that story to life. And here you can see obviously some documentation as you kind of navigate through. RSA is another kind of key example of how they're kind of taking a slightly different approach. So this is more in terms of performance um, ESG. So again, we're now back into the investor section, thinking about that strategic data and understanding how users can use those metrics and targets to really understand what the business is doing to achieve its goals. So here again, chief risk officer ownership as a business, what the importance and prominence is, thinking about that progress in terms of within the marketplace of 2019, thinking about the 2020 priorities. And what I think is really interesting in these kind of core areas around governance and risk management is also then linking that back to, you know, the key data, thinking about how we can showcase those graphs and understanding what the targets and the, the progress is. And then also linking that back, as we mentioned earlier, to TCFD framework and how they're actually intertwining that. And I think that's something that will develop in terms of that storytelling kind of going forward. There wouldn't be a presentation, as you know, at the moment without discussing things around COVID, but I think it's an important kind of element to understand how businesses are bringing that to life. As Erica was talking, you know, thinking about how they're doing it has been done in a myriad of ways, including just having kind of, you know, news case studies on the on the page. But actually now what we're seeing is increasingly, you know, companies thinking about how um, they can bring that story to the fore and understanding where it sits. The traditional element we've seen is really kind of focusing on the media center kind of section. Again, understanding how the responses kind of work together, thinking about them, you know, how it relates to obviously all the different kind of stakeholders in terms of the information that's here in terms of what we're looking at. So whether it be customers, colleagues, suppliers, et cetera, and understanding what that kind of resonation is in terms of the, the content. And then going a little bit further in terms of how that relates, obviously, then to brands, helping the communities, thinking about what that means in terms of their own partnerships, and then obviously related news items. So again, it's an added level of kind of content in terms of that first response element that we're seeing there in terms of uh, a nice example. United Utilities, again, um, have this uh, on their corporate site. So um, as we're seeing, you know, 
you'll see here front and center with purpose and vision alongside COVID. Again, our trends are being seen here front and center on the website in terms of how you navigate through. Interestingly, not available in the navigation at the moment um, in terms of COVID, it's done as a separate section. We can't locate it in here. But again, a nice response in terms of how the outbreak is kind of manifesting itself. And obviously then thinking about how it um, impacts customers um, communities and everything intertwined and then obviously linking you off to relevant sections within the, the kind of site. Um, who's done it slightly differently so again Anglo being a, a great example but they've actually included it in the main sub kind of section in terms of navigation so again thinking about how this is kind of front and center for them and understanding then you know how that brings it to life so you saw there a moment ago that you've obviously got the Mark Kutafani blog but you've also then got the ability to bring all of these stories to life in terms of the uh, the elements around kind of messaging people um, and everything else in between. And again, a really nice example of how they're kind of showcasing not just what they've done, but also where they're going, thinking about the targets, thinking about what they need to achieve um, and how it's all going. And also then bringing together centralized repositories of documentation and everything else. Uh, conscious of time and I won't dwell too much on those but I just wanted to show you a couple more in terms of examples. Um, Erica did mention obviously data and I think the importance of data and understanding how users are kind of you know leveraging that on site so Rolls-Royce is probably the best example we can find in terms of the uh, the data and interactivity of this in terms of understanding how they can drill down to sustainability focused elements. So again you can start looking at how you know the impact of people thinking about maybe let's go with training and then it starts to give me interactive charts and graphs that I can then start drilling down to and understanding what that data is, the ability to obviously compare data, download data. And again, the power of that in terms of audiences and understanding exactly what they're looking for, and whether you wanted to go a slightly different way and then see greenhouse gas emissions, for example, um, they then give you specific examples of things that they feel that you're better off seeing in terms of the main focal focus points of their kind of element. And then finally, we've got the uh, the example of Compass, and again, that sustainability data, thinking about how that kind of the, the strategy is brought together. And they've got some great kind of examples of that materiality analysis. So thinking about then again, what the priorities are of the business, thinking about what that kind of discussion on materiality needs to be in terms of the high impact elements, what the impact is in terms of the importance for a stakeholder versus the business, and then bringing all that together. And again, a central place for all users to really understand and showcase. Um, I think that's it for the example. So uh, Rich, we go back to the, uh, the presentation and we can just uh, finalize off the, uh, the, uh, the summaries. Yeah, sure. We've got a couple of interesting questions as well, actually. Um, firstly, um, in our experience, who owns the overall corporate website uh, narrative? Um, and is that changing as content becomes more timely and innovative? Um, and I think probably it's a more typical role of a kind of head of corporate comms. Um, I think that would probably tend to own that. Um, I think it's, it's a good point in the sense that, um, you know, you can get ownership of different areas of the site. Um, that may not then be entirely uh, intertwined, but I guess that's you know what we see in terms of government structures. Is there anything else you'd, you'd add to that, Mark? Sometime? I think it's spot on, Rich. I think the, the interesting thing for me is how the analytics is backing that up and thinking about how websites are becoming more joined up. So less siloed, less owned by, you know, the careers team, the investment team, you know, sustainability team, and thinking about how users actually want to navigate through the site. So actually, you know, you saw earlier from the examples we were giving, you know, investors going off to different areas to find information and really making sure that they aren't siloed. But exactly that, I think that there is more um, collaboration now in terms of how sites are being put together and thinking more about it not just from the business structure but what the user wants and how the user needs and that's mm -hmm. why we always talk about that narrative flow on websites and how users then use that to uh, understand about the business and what they you know the key information for them is yeah next question is phil is a fantastic question and um, which is balancing accessibility requirements, you know, with basically making more interactive and engaging uh, content, you like know, Burberry, Teams and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that is a perennial debate. Um, we have, and I'm sure many of you do, uh, particularly if you're going for, you know, double A or uh, above in terms of accessibility. And so obviously things like static alternatives or uh, image replacements for, uh, you know, animations and so on would be uh, important uh, for, for meeting accessibility guidelines. But, it is a real challenge, you know, particularly wanting to do uh, text over imagery and so on. So uh, fully recognize that. Um, and I think it probably comes down to just a judgment call between 
you know, the uh, accessibility standard you want to adhere to um, versus delivering an experience um, and ideally just providing a form of alternative. Yeah, that's spot on, Rich. And I think that it, fundamentally it's that element of saying there are technology element things that we can now do to enhance that, you know, such as the data and everything else. You know, there's overlays mm -hmm. and things that help with the accessibility element of screen readers and beyond. Yeah. Um, and then the next question was, do FTSE companies have a separate corporate site to their custom site? Because um, obviously we reference a lot around corporate sites. Thanks for that question, Katie. Um, I think it's probably a mixed bag, to be honest, depending a little bit around how much they use their corporate site or how, how consumer facing they are. Yeah. Um, I think we probably see a bit of a mixed bag, don't we? Um, yeah. In terms of that, some do um, blend them entirely together. Um, I think if they are separate, then one of the challenges obviously is to make sure that the narrative around who you are and what you do and so on is consistent. Um, but then, uh, well, Erica, anything different to, to add on that front? No, I think uh, you've been I think you've covered that. We we have to obviously very be very uh, conscious when when auditing to make sure that we audit the corporate sites um, mm -hmm. because that is uh, well the, the more and more. I know traditionally corporate sites are targeted at investors, but more and more again it's uh, seen as a one stop vehicle to mm -hmm. carry the corporate story. And, and, and that's why our metrics are over in the 200s, right? Uh, we need yeah. to capture a lot of that. Yeah, yeah we but, wanted to do, um, do some analysis around the, um, I guess, the more product uh, and, uh, I guess, uh, solution sides of corporate sites, but it's very difficult to um, compare, right? So we do tend to obviously focus on the corporate uh, metrics. I, d I do think it's a challenge, though, Rich, in terms of that the consistency you mentioned. When you think about, mm. you know, the, the consumer site, the corporate site, might have a careers site what we're seeing is a lot of companies coming to us and asking for assistance in terms of bringing those things all together um in terms of the narrative in terms yeah. of how the content works but also often in terms of the technology as well mm. cool. okay. um, and i guess we're also seeing in some areas split split level navigations aren't we or uh, early siloing of content so you either want to go into company information or solutions area you know a bit like siemens i think is an example that do that um, or a hierarchy of content in the top top area of navigation. So that's some, somehow uh, companies get around that challenge. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. That global nav is becoming more important in terms of users understanding which bit they're in, in terms of, uh, mm. from a user point of view. Yeah. Um, in answer to just in this question, yes, the presentation deck will be available later. We'll send that out to uh, all registered attendees. Um, and the question around how long will it take to build a corporate site is very tricky to answer. I think the fastest we've done it in is about four months, but that's a bit of a hair raising ride. Um, typically, I would say you should probably allow around uh, eight or nine months would be my guidance, uh, depending on the size and complexity of it. Um, so hopefully that... Uh, Rich, can I we, uh, bring your attention, sorry, to one, one question that I had answered in the chat, but uh, maybe you had missed. Mm -hmm. Somebody asked about, are we seeing companies using their corporate websites to communicate on their net zero strategies and how? I uh, just want to quickly answer that live, and, and I would say absolutely. I think we, we are seeing the, the uptick uh, pretty uh, obviously given UK's recent commitment to a net zero economy by 2050. And what we've seen is that the approaches range from, uh, you know, full text outline of strategy and target. Uh, an example would be a legal and general to a more visual representation uh, with, let's say, a high level two minute video overview and then linking that uh, strategy to uh, their overall corporate strategy and also further details like uh, BP has such a site, for example. And yeah, mm -hmm. just want to bring that up. Okay, great. Um, and somebody's asked if it's possible to get a recording of this as well as the slides. Um, yeah, we'll see if we can make that available again to the uh, attendees. So, thank you for that question. Um, Dan, should we skip to the uh, final couple of slides just conscious of the yep, time? Let's do it. Thank you. Wonderful. I mean, I think, uh, firstly, thank you for staying with us through the uh, hour presentation. I know it can be quite hard to uh, keep a uh, sustained uh, connection through a, a slide presentation for that length of time, so I appreciate that. I mean, I think what we've seen today, you know, as evidenced by your own poll uh, survey is, you know, how important corporate websites are in the overall communications mix. Um, you know, clearly even more important in a COVID world. 
Um, we're seeing more around responsibility and long-term sustainability communications topping the agenda. And frankly, you know, again, as you highlight in your own survey response, you know, the great importance of the wider corporate narrative. You know, so communicating your purpose, a better and more sophisticated articulation and connection of your strategy. Probably a greater spotlight on ESG, especially for uh, investor audiences, but you know, there's probably a bit more to do in the wider sustainability story. And so I think those are probably the, uh, the main things that we're, we're seeing across. Um, and I think then in terms of the, um, you know, how well your website performs, do feel free to reach out to us. Um, there are a couple of options uh, available to you. Firstly, there's a kind of a summary review that we do where we'll just recap what we assess, share some of the key trends, give you a bit of an overview of how you perform um, and a comparison to the average uh, you know, FTSE performance um, with broad kind of high level territories for improvement. And then if you wish, you know, there's a fuller report available um, where we give you kind of named peer review. We'll target more around specific weaknesses and opportunities for each area in your website um, and also a relevant best practice example. So do get in touch with us um, if you'd like us to compile any of those reports for you. Not a problem at all. And then uh, finally, again, pop some QR codes in. Um, those of you that are interested in uh, what makes a great career site, um, that's a separate uh, webinar on the 29th of September. Um, we separated that out because there are so many different audiences interested in that area of the website. And then there's a more practical kind of um, webinar on creating great user experience. Um, so um, that'll be not only some of the results that we found in our analysis, but it also gives you some hints and tips on how you should review your user experience and how you can improve it. So do feel free to uh, join and register for those webinars. We'd love to see you there. Um, and as I say, get in touch if there's anything we can help you with in terms of reviewing or assessing your own corporate site, we'd be very happy to, to help. Um, and I think that's bang on 11 o'clock. So brilliant. Thank you very much for your attendance. And uh, hopefully we'll speak to quite a few of you soon. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.